welcome everyone once again to the Free Radical Media Podcast. I am one of your hosts, Eric Picard, joined as ever by my co-host Patrick Ryan. Tonight we're uh, we're, we're going to have an old friend of the podcast back on, uh, Dan the Lion. Um, <clears throat> if you uh, if if you don't remember, uh, Dan. Um, came on the show some months back and we talked about uh, his organization Return to Nature um, and uh, Earth-based philosophy. Uh, Dan is a forger, herbalist, and uh, founder of Return to Nature, an educational organization that uh, offers classes, workshops, and education about wild plant and mushroom foraging, herbalism, uh, primitive and survival skills, and uh, Earth-based philosophy. it was a really fun conversation last time, so we've been looking forward to it. Checking back in with Dan. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. Good to uh, talk with you guys again. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. We actually have just been talking before the podcast. Um, pretty excited about the show tonight. It, it sounds like you've um, you've really been involved um, in a lot of interesting projects, You know, a lot of interesting things going on. Um, well, I guess, first of all, Tell everybody a little bit more about Return to Nature um, and what you guys do. Um. Cool. So uh, I guess the way it's taking form is that there's sort of me running around teaching workshops based on uh, all the things you mentioned, uh, kombucha, fermentation, to add to that, um, all those kind of things. And we're getting into more kind of ceremonial aspects um, and then also, basically, we're starting to work with kind of uh, custom-making people, herbals, herbal uh, formulas and things uh, for what ails them. And uh, that's then also we are trying to work on a project called Seeking the Medicine, which is basically just a, an outreach connection program to get people who are, are medicine beings and, and teachers uh, to channel and to flow into our modern culture so that we can kind of preserve their knowledge. So that's uh, some of the things in a nutshell. Yeah, certainly, certainly. And, and, and definitely seeking the medicine. I definitely want to talk about this project I, I, uh, in some some detail. It, it, you're Basically, it, it's a multimedia project, right? I mean, you're going to have, um, what, video, audio interviews, um, text. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so basically what I see with, with the technology that's available, um, if I'm going to go into a culture and be non-invasive, uh, you know, there's, there's a certain level of, well, sometimes it feels appropriate to record audio. Sometimes it's okay to record video, but I don't want to make something based on just shoving uh, multimedia outlets into people's faces because I find that it changes the energy tremendously. So I'm really trying to seek that balance of really going in and mining uh, wisdom data, information, uh, sharing, and really trying to see what I have available from all the mixed media that I'm working with and then sort of piece together some of the journey. So it's taking the form in of field guides and uh, field guides and travelogues, which would be like, uh, you know, the writing section, and that will share some of the stories, some of the people I've met with, some of the conversations we've had, uh, and the teachings uh, that unfold, as well as all the wild plants that I basically find all over the place just by looking on the ground as soon as I end up somewhere, um, and and try to identify them, work with them as food and medicine, uh, which I find to be really enjoyable as sort of a life survival experiment. Of just saying, well, if, you know, if I just dropped here, who do I recognize? And this is kind of my inner practice of working with the plants and learning how to just completely blast open my senses uh, with a grounded level of botanical understanding and carefulness. Um, And then really just uh, there's video and these things are just going to come together kind of into the all object of broadcasting something or other. (laughs) Hmm. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Uh, you're, yeah, now you've traveled, you've traveled quite a bit here. Um, <clears throat> that you're behind this project, and you're you're talking about foraging. We we talked about foraging at some length in the last show. How different is it going to an area? 
you, you know, I mean, it's not like going from, you know, like upstate New York to the Midwest, right? Obviously, there's different biosystems involved there. But I mean, we're talking about, you know, other continents, you know, uh, complete, you know, different um, ecospheres. Mm -hmm. So like how, how, how different or difficult is it to, you know, kind of gain that knowledge in order to, you know, kind of support yourself off the off the land? Well, if you mean by support yourself, um, so for me, the support must take the shape of recognition of anything, um, feeling like there are familiar friends wherever I go. If you're talking about, you know, from a purely survival perspective to eat off the land, um, you know, that's really something that is very romanticized um, and without going into a huge spiel on that but basically all television survival shows are slow starvation all of the people on them pig out when they get out of those situations um, fats proteins carbohydrates uh, are extremely hard to come by uh, mm -hmm. even if you know the situation I mean I grew up in New Jersey and still fat uh, in New Jersey from, from plant-based life forms, uh, we could say is about 1% of everything that's out there. So, you know, the, it depends on what level. So for me, there's another level of sustenance, uh, which comes from being able to get to, say, I just recently uh, returned from Colombia, to be able to get to Colombia and recognize anything and to start pulling out patterns of identification. So um, actually on my YouTube channel, Return to Nature Skills, I put up this video of finding actually one of my favorite plants that I work with, but I've never I've never met it live, which is the Sida, Sida genus acuta. Sida acuta is this profound anti-malarial and antiviral. And so uh, recommended by Stephen Harrod Buner, I was able to purchase this and I brought it to both India as well as um, as when I went to Colombia and literally I'm looking at this plant and I recognize a cheese wheel which is some uh, identification characteristic of the mallow family and I suddenly recognize that I'm staring at a mallow and of course the Sida acuta is in the Malvaceae so once I was able to come do some research I, I was totally blown away that I had instinctively met one of my friends that I had already ingested into my body. Hmm. Now, this, with, with this, that particular plant, it's anti-malarial. It grows in Colombia uh, indigenously. Does it also grow in other parts of the world where malaria is prevalent? I would actually suggest that uh, it's spread from probably, I think its hometown is Africa. Uh, mm -hmm. So it has spread, you know, and now it's become either naturalized or is indigenous to South America. That I'm not sure. Uh, but that would be the the process of trying to understand. But just like at the same time, um, the earth is in flux, the plants are in flux, the people are in flux, everything is in flux, people are moving, people are bringing seeds, people are shifting all over the place. And of course, we have to see that the plants are also doing that. So who is natural and who is unnatural in any ecosystem? It's a really gray area question, which often gets taken to be extremely not gray area, which is just poppycock it's really right nice. right 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 at the end of so, the day it's pretty much irrelevant yeah well what picture do you want to use as your frame of reference point is really the this the size of the question determines everything sure sure and i mean even as far as like the medicinal properties of these plants you know i've i've heard um it said before the uh the amazonian plants uh uncaria tormentosa uh mm -hmm. aka cat's claw that uh, it has a very yang element to it, and I thought that was fascinating because you know the whole yin yang paradigm is is you know classically Chinese, and the reason why they said that is because oh you know it has the thorns on it, and that mm -hmm. it it means it has a very you know yang element when you see a plant mm -hmm. with that sort of property. Um, do you agree with that sort of understanding? Are there any other sort of signatures to look at with these plants to see if they have? what sort of medicinal elements they have to it? Well, I would just sort of start that with a di disclaimer of that I have trained myself. So this is now going 15, 16, 17 years into this sort of little hobby that I have. So 
I'm looking at certain signatures with a big quotes around them that perhaps people aren't even paying attention to when they engage a plant. So it really is relative to who is perceiving. Uh, it's like a quantum physics thing. You know, the observer is going to determine everything about what you can recognize about the plant. And so, you know, I know properties and signatures and aspects of plants because of my continued meditation observation study of them that enables me to get into that position and I'm very careful. So that's sort of the disclaimer aspect of it. As far as cat's claw having thorns and therefore showing some power, uh, which is seen as yang, right? Or which is seen as, uh, uh, you know, powerful. We can see these signatures uh, throughout herbal medicine. There has been innumerable attempts to try to constitutionalize medicine, or I should say herbs, um, and, and those things are exactly what we want to look out for. We want to look for the signatures and we want to start intuiting the signatures of that, but we don't want to be foolish about it and we want to be very careful that we always verify that with the science that's available. So if I'm feeling a plant is yang and I know that it's not poisonous and I chew it and I do a meditation, I could do a two day fast. I could do a week and a half fast on that plant alone and journal all about it and get to know it and then verify what I've seen. And this is a way to test your intuition. It's the yoga of botany essentially because then you either see damn, my intuition is either totally crazy or the what I'm reading is totally not accurate or I have to reconcile uh, where my intuition lies and where my gut feeling takes me. So this is what I love about it. Wow, that that's that's fascinating. That reminds me of um, what they call in the Amazon the, the La Dieta or the diet oh, that the dieta. shamans go through, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, that's that's a very interesting thing because what I seem to have gotten from that phenomena is one of the things I haven't heard really talked about so much is how it's actually a pre-colonial diet, if you think about it. They're going back into the roots of no salt, right? Just basically jungle living, simple carbohydrates and fish, you know, these with no salt, you know, no sugar, none of these colonial drugs, no, no caffeine, nothing like that, even though uh, it's coffee was obviously grown in Colombia somewhere. Um, yeah, yeah. But, you know, they're really kind of cleaning out these colonial superimpositions on themselves. So, uh, you know, and that's really just getting to the point where you can be more sensitive to one plant versus take 5,000 of them and not have any idea what you're feeling. Hmm. That is interesting. No, it certainly is, you know, especially the idea of allowing your body and mind to be acquainted with a, a specific plant, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I do find that to be, to be fascinating. It, it, and it's, <clears throat> I don't know, the ecosystems are so dynamic. And you're right, it's, it's about... It's about pulling those threads together, right? I mean, the, the, the dynamism of <clears throat> being able to be acquainted with a plant, being able in our modern time to have the scientific data on a plant, I mean, those things are equally valuable. Right. And, um, yeah, I, I don't know. It, that's, that's an interesting way of, of looking at it, I think. And, and perhaps we can just say that it's actually all of those levels that we have access to, to engage a being would cause a new level of acquainting and all of them are necessary and all of them are wonderful. However, we shouldn't just become, uh, uh sort of, disconnected rationalists and go around telling plants what their Latin name is and then walking away. Um, there's a lot more in there as far as an engagement to unlock the voice, so to speak, of each particular herb. And this is where herbalism initially comes from, or we can say the basis of shamanism or whatever, is that if I actually sensitize myself, sensitize myself and work with a plant carefully, systematically, gradually, empirically, scientifically, right? This mm -hmm. is like incredibly scientific. It's not anti-science, but the, the right. plant will begin to speak in a way that is instinctual and intuitive. And we can actually know that plant in a way that we're 
uh, not familiar. We weren't familiar with. Actually, it was Susan Weed. I, I either heard somewhere or read somewhere. She said, uh, uh, if a plant tells you something and the book doesn't say that, the plant is right, you know? <laughs> right. But be careful. I mean, don't make that into a self delusional uh, process because we are kind of confused in our senses and we need to. Uh, practice. You know, this is a practice. It's an evolutionary practice that uh, most three-year-olds in the Amazon would have been masters of by the time they were five. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and it, like you said earlier, you know, your level of intu intuition with plants has taken you 15, 17 years, you know. Um, we, we've really, I think, lost some of that intuitive... Uh, the, just the intuitive insight or, or the intuitive thought process, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I think, you know, increasingly, and, and, and look, this is, again, not a statement against science, but, but rationalism and materialism, I think, have kind of, the, the scales have been tipped in its favor against the kind of intuitive, spiritual, emotional, you know, passionate discovery of things. You know, I, I, I really feel that we've lost something there. And I, I think we need to, bring, need to bring that back into balance. Well, um, you know, you know, it's not that it's lost. It's that it's flabby. It's mm. like a muscle that's not getting touched or used or accessed. And so it's a re really hopeful thing because it's not something you can lose. And so basically what it seems to be is that there's another brain and it's the gut. And there's neurons there. This the second largest grouping of neurons is in the gut. And there's a huge amount of discovery happening about this nerve network in the gut. And of course, you look at that and you're like, oh, yeah, my gut feelings. Duh. Um, so we all have these tremendous gut feelings. And the problem is that we're in a paradigm which disregards the gut feeling. So we actually have to just retrain ourselves to say, hey, wait a minute, that's one of the voices in my internal council of being. You know, my mind, my heart, my head, and for most people, you know, downstairs, uh, you know, and we have these different levels of voices within ourselves, and they are all very good at extracting different levels of sensorum, data, input uh, in any given experience. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I see exactly what you mean. It's like that full, you know, dynamic range of human experience, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, 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 precisely. And, 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 and you're right. We don't always we don't always use all those things, you know, and, and those muscles are they don't get they don't get stretched so much anymore. <laughs> right. You know. And and for most people, they're ignored. And so, you know, when you eat the candy and you ignore the feeling in your gut that says, hmm, maybe you shouldn't be doing this. And you say, ah, shut up. And you just keep doing that. Like that is the path towards illness. And so if, you know, in, in a, that's it. And so then that means the opposite is true, where if I actually start to allow my gut feeling to override the rational nonsense that can occur within my mind to justify my old patterns into continually beating myself with many different ways, then, you know, that's another way of existing and being. And it probably is more close to what indigenous people were doing, um, specifically shamans, but everyone in the culture was more gut-based or heart-based. Unless, yeah. you know, there were minorities of people. But, you know, the funny thing in, in those contexts, like they would be like, oh, you know, so and so Joe's broken. And so he's like out of his gut, you know, and so he needs a healing ceremony. And here we are dancing for 14 hours straight around Joe so that he can remember his gut and his vision. And instantly it would be dealt with. Here we're just all, you know, forgetting and we're not doing any of the ceremonies or any of the real uh, traditions that recapitulate our awareness back into our being and our felt sense. Of course, what this is, is empirical experience. And it's so weird. This is the missing piece of science, which we now need to put together, which is that, holy crap, your experience is the thing that we need to start using statistics to determine. For example, my favorite uh, recent example is how many people in the United States have 
after their mother or father dies, have a dream where that person comes to them in a dream and they say, hey, it's going to be okay, and hugs them or something. And the person feels tremendous relief and then wakes up and says, oh, well, great. That was my mind, you know. But the thing is, the relief is real. The phenomena is real. The experience in the empirical experience has value. And so I hope that we can start touching that with our scientific means. Yeah, yeah. I, I First of all, I know people, you know, uh, who have experienced that, you know. Yeah. And it, it, it's a very common thing. And there's many, many, many examples of, of just that. Yeah. You know, at, at going back to, you know, for probably one of the first people to study those kinds of things was was Carl Jung. Mm -hmm. um, but but you're you're completely right. Like there is nothing that makes that experience and then the emotional and physical relief of that experience. I mean, th th that's that's very real and tangible, you know, and our current science doesn't you know they don't like they don't like to measure things like that they don't like to go into things like that you know i think the paradigm of the scientific community just kind of that they want to dismiss it although increasingly that's changing you know but that's been true in the past and can't i mean how how would science go about measuring that i mean i mean right now you see people doing like brain scans of you know when whenever someone's in an altered state you know trying to quantify what part of the brain lights up when people are having certain experiences but besides that it really makes me wonder how will we start delving into these subjective experiences because i i agree i do think that's an entirely new universe that science will step foot into when we start taking those things seriously well perhaps it's it's very easy it's record the after effects how simple so recording the after effects of how people's lives change and make statistics were you a more of a dick b less of a dick c yeah, did not yeah. change yeah right kind of right. kind of sounds like the um the study that uh, dennis mckenna and a few others did on the saint odemi churches and uh, the people that were often indulging in ayahuasca and then they sort of put them in a st statistically analyzed them afterwards and, you know, showed, oh, well, you know, they have extremely low levels of alcoholism, extremely low levels of depression, etc. I think that sort of serves as a good model for that sort of thing. This is the really exciting thing about what I feel is now coming uh, with the plant teachers specifically is that there's starting to be an undeniable amount of evidence that goes contrary to the old way. The old way, which is saying, oh, my God, you'll die. You'll jump out of a window. You're Myrtle, you'll murder someone. Something bad will happen. It's sort of that uh, – I forget that movie about marijuana – uh, Reefer madness. Reefer madness. Yeah, this propaganda, right? <laughs> so we're kind of getting now these scientists to do some of this research and show that like, wow, you know, less people are dying and freaking out than you said you would. But then what I find is that like, wow, that means that we need a responsible example of our culture. And then the man, so to speak, would literally lay off and let, you know, let this thing happen as it needs to. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Although, <clears throat> I would say that there are, there are elements of you know the man, right, or the establishment, whatever you want to call it, that will do everything in their power never to allow these types of things sure. to happen. Then we'll you know? just then we'll just go back to not telling them about it. It's fine. exactly right. We're gonna yeah. do it. It's just are they gonna be uh, willing and interested to watch it happen? You know, that's the the whole question. It's not. You know, we know that drug laws do nothing. It, and if if anything, it makes it more appealing. And probably the reason we have more addiction is because it is more uh, secretive and esoteric and uh, more naughty. And kids want to break the rules, and we get stuck in those patterns. And I'm sure that's even a consciously efforted situation because as soon as that one person does that stupid thing then that's what gets put all over the media but now the media who watches the i mean you know i don't know anybody who watches the news anymore besides 
people that are my relatives versus people that are my friends. I think right. most of us are getting sort of a, uh, an online Facebook media thing now more than watching CNN or something. So I'm hopeful that those old ways are just actually skeletons now and they're slowly dying as we just go towards something I'd like to call no duh, which is just more intuitive and we all know that it's there. Yeah, there's definitely uh, there's definitely a shift in the culture. You know, I'll, I'll definitely say that there's certainly a shift in the culture. And it's really, uh, you know, that's why we're, we're always so optimistic here, honestly. You know, um, there is an interesting level of change happening right now. I, you know, probably at, at least in the United States, fundamentally since the 1960s, but it's it's global. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and the level of interaction interaction we can achieve with the Internet now, you know, um, where, you know, for example, a guy like you can go down to Colombia or India, right, speak with, you know, interesting, enlightened, knowledgeable people and then be able to communicate that with large numbers of people almost immediately. I mean, it's that's something that's never before happened in human history. Yeah. And this is the thing. It's all been a language problem if you really think about it. And and mm-hmm. so this little indigenous shaman in the middle of the jungle is speaking wisdom, and yet he's in such a language. He's speaking Watoto or something. And so there's really a, a language barrier, but that's all changing. And that's one of the things that global culture is starting to bring to us is the ability to see how someone feels in Guam in a minute and a half. <laughs> you know? yeah. yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> Right, and have that level of communication. Yeah, and um, you could Skype with somebody on Guam that you meet on Facebook in five minutes in seconds. It's profound, the implications. It is. Uh, I don't know honestly, Guam is. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, just, I just had, a, I just had a, a instance I was, uh, you know, I was, I was on the Facebook, you know, I was, I was doing, well, I was actually doing stuff for Free Radical Media, and um, uh, this Swedish artist who I, I don't really know, you do um, now. I, I, yeah, right. I made contact with him within five minutes. He had called me yeah. over the internet, you know, and I had a conversation with him, you know, that he's a, he's a Sweden. I've never been to Sweden. Right. I honestly don't know much about Swedish culture. <laughs> you know, now, but here now I am you know a lot to, more than you did, you know, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Here I am talking to this artist, you know, thousands of miles away on another continent. I mean, it's, it's profound. It's incredible. You know? Yeah. But let's go back. Um, let's go back to that that little shaman in 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 the in the forest you were just talking about. I, I really want to ask you about some of your travels, right? Mm-hmm. Um, do you want to talk about Colombia a little bit? Sure, sure. Yes. You know, so, I... so what what was the zeitgeist of of coming together with this project first of all, and then like why did you decide to go to Colombia? I don't know. Just tell us a little bit about it. Sure. So basically, uh, this was more of a serendipitous experience. My rational mind never even really considered to go to Colombia uh, or South America. Uh, one of my friends, uh, her friend had come from Colombia. He rented her apartment and uh, or he used her apartment for like a week and said, you know what? Thank you so much. In return, you come to Colombia. I'll buy you a ticket. And she was like, oh, wow, that's so great. And she uh, used her miles to buy me a ticket. So, okay, I'm going to Colombia. Sure, I'm not going to say no. And so, of course, then as we're talking about what we're going to do, and of course, I would bring my medicine-seeking research there always. I mean, everywhere I go, I'm looking at plants. So, obviously, I'm going to be documenting plants. I'm going to be looking for what's there. And then, of course, our friend Andreas says, you know, Oh, well, there's this uh, taita that I know, and and uh, I've drank uh, ayahuasca, or as they call in Colombia, yaje, with him, and he's the legit, like, he's legit, he's the real deal. Um, and, of course, I trusted Andreas, my friend, and so, therefore, we had a really verified connection into something very deep. And uh, so, of course, then you got to go seeking the medicine when it calls you. Sure, absolutely. Was um, <clears throat> what what was the experience like? Well, you know, I I find that whenever you're trying to engage with a sort of uh, entity or or space or beingness or essence, 
um, things start to come up as you're preparing for that journey. And so it's really important that people get a holistic perspective of, because if you're going to work with these plants, it's not that they will do something to you, just like a doctor won't fix you, you know? So like part of it is having your intent clear, having yourself in a way where you're in a prayerful state to where you're actually asking uh, for a certain uh, interaction. And so I find this to be really important. And of course, as this was occurring, you know, uh, aspects of my own neuroticism were coming out and it was wonderful to just observe me letting go because actually what I had found was that uh, I really was blown away that South America is America. So at one time I said, yeah, I'm from America. And someone in Colombia was like, yeah, me too. And it just blew yeah. my mind yeah. to realize that it's it's Amerigo. It's Amerigo Vespucci. It's two conquistadors on two different ships. One went north, one went south. And, and the Spanish conquered. You know, the Spanish and Portuguese conquered South America. And so Spanish is not the indigenous language of South America, right? And then the same is true for North America. And it just totally was uh, very amazing to be completely saturated in Spanish, which I am very poor at. But with the help of like, uh, you know, Google Translate and stuff like that, it's really amazing how you can definitely be much more careful than you would. So with that long intro, uh, basically with the yahe, with uh, ayahuasca, I would definitely suggest that never try to force the experience and don't go to another, uh, one of these countries and just like look for somebody because you will just get not a good experience. Um, so that's my disclaimer on it. So that's a little start. But, you know, then it's like, OK, how was it? Absolutely profound. Is that satisfying? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, yes and no. <laughs> um, we, uh, we, we've talked to other people, you know, um, we, we, we talked to um, a psychologist who takes people down there for, um, you know, therapeutic IS sessions, you know, so, you know, we're kind of familiar with it. List, our listeners might be a little bit familiar with it. Um, but yeah, that's what everybody says. It's absolutely profound. However, we have a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I would ask you, uh, honestly, I, I'd like you, um, if you could, to take us from, first of all, meeting the shaman, what your uh, impressions were, okay, like what the setting was. I'd like to know what the setting was. And then, um, and then, and then go into, if, you know, however much detail you want about, yeah. about the actual experience itself, you know. Great. Um, yeah, so basically the forthcoming experience was that since we had gotten connected with this, uh, so basically in Colombia, the tradition is called Yahe, and they're called the Taitas, uh, which is a shaman. So that's the Colombian tradition. In Peru, uh, in Iquitos, where uh, basically the phenomena of ayahuasca tourism is occurring, is happening there, and literally it's just completely saturated with ayahuasca, and that's sort of the Quechua uh, culture there. So I liked the fact that I was going away from the, the direction that everyone else was going um, into a very much more sort of simple but verified, but like really low-key, quiet experience. This is really the only thing I, I don't want to like a rock star ayahuasca experience, you know. So we just basically uh, connected with a friend down there who translated for us and he brought us uh, to the experience, to, to this Taita. And uh, he's a profound person. And, um, you know, my first impressions were this guy's like, you know, huge he's a tall man and we were brought to a maloka which is actually a traditional hut uh, for for drinking the ayahuasca and i think the uh, maloka means actually the house of the cosmos and so what they do there is they drink ayahuasca and as as we were there talking we had learned that actually in colombia uh in this area specifically that i was in there's a lot more um, localized experience like it seems that in in Peru it's like the locals aren't as interested as all the tourists coming in but in uh, Colombia there's much more of a deep kind of culture around uh, this phenomena so we were basically the, the only gringos there 
So, you know, we were told we're, life is a celebration, and he brought the ayahuasca, and uh, we one at a time came up after some opening uh, ceremony, and he looked at me, and he said, buenas pintas, which means good colors, and uh, I chugged the, the cup down. And part of what I felt like I needed to do was really to respect that plant as I try to do with all plants. So it's very important to me to not be like, oh, yuck, or something, or like, oh, what is this, or something like that. So I really yeah. try to just embrace the entirety of the medicine, uh, similar to like eating raw dandelion greens out of a backyard, just really getting into the place of like, I'm really embracing you fully and I'm allowing you in deeply. Um, so I sure did. And then um, it's very interesting because basically there was a guy who was talking the whole time and it was definitely not bothering me, but it was bothering some. And so then I actually went, uh, put a fire in the log and he took the fire, he took the log out. Uh, sorry, I put a log in the fire. He took the log out. I was like, this is weird. So I went outside. I was like, man, I'm not feeling anything. This is so bizarre. Like, I'm going to have the bummer trip, right? Like, this this is going to be interesting. And, of course, I came back inside and sat down, and it just hit me all. And um, since I had prior experience with salvia divinorum and, and DMT, I thought, well, cool. I'm sure ayahuasca is like DMT but longer. Okay. And that was my frame of reference point. But it turns out that ayahuasca, this experience was much stronger than that. And I have, I have, you know, I have pretty taken a hero, heroic dose, so to speak, of, of both of those uh, uh, plants or plant teachers. And so this was extremely large, so large. I mean, bigger than the DMT realm, you know, and that. That was, I thought, was the biggest thing you could ever conceive of. Um, so, you know, then I was just basically floored, uh, literally, figuratively, metaphorically. And I just basically was laying on my back the whole time, which basically some people say, you know, sit upright and sort of be like in the ride. And other people say, like, just lay back and enjoy the ride. Um, so, you know, when you're if you're ever in this situation, you might consider, you know, what kind of phenomena you want to have. I always try to go for like the, well, show me what's beyond death kind of thing, uh, for better or worse. So I kind of like to let my body just completely lay still and allow it, allow myself to just forget my body. Um, and I sure did for about 14 hours and most people vomit and I actually didn't vomit early in the time I just laid there entirely uh, with an interaction with the Gaian consciousness and I was able to ask everything I wanted and instantly I was shown everything that I wanted to know and so I feel like that's a very important thing of where if you have a clear intent and you're going in there and you're saying well what can I learn so that we can get humanity out of this issue you know like this is the reason to engage these plant teachers for me and I would suggest try it uh, to anybody who's listening because really what you can do is you can receive wisdom that I mean obviously to the person experiencing it is beyond anything that they could ever conceive of. And yet from the outside, for all the people who've never consumed it, think like, oh yeah, you're having a hallucination. Well, that's a fun thing if you've never tried, but it doesn't hold weight to your actual experience. Um, so, you know, after uh, some time it started for some people. Uh, so basically after four hours, it's kind of like, wow, well, this has been pretty profound and I'm feeling pretty good on this. And, and thanks for the ride, you know, because who's that sound like to you? Perhaps psilocybin mushrooms, you know, four to six hours. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not yeah. with ayahuasca, you know, she's like, oh, cool. So, yeah, you're, we're just getting started, you know. And so this is more of like for me, it was till two o'clock in the afternoon the next day. 
Um, so that was at pretty much 8 p.m. or 9 p.m. to about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I had was completely in some sort of either samadhi state or psychosis or schizophrenia or a mixture of all of them, um, just completely one with God and one with the guy in consciousness and had this energy pulsing and flowing through me. And I was basically just asking her, it, the consciousness, the grid, uh, what I can do to be of service because what else are you going to ask, you know? Yeah. So that's a little bit. So do you have any questions based on any of that? Well, first of all, the shaman you were dealing with, was he more of like a Catholic Christian background or was he straight indigenous? Well, I can only, basically I did not ask him that formally. Um, but from what I experienced, he... I mean, so there's a phenomena which is called mestizo shamanism, which is sort of the Catholic indigenous mixed shamanism. It's very mm. popular in 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 Peru. Here, yeah. it's kind of like I don't know that really anybody's too interested in the Yahe phenomena in that same way. So, like, what he was doing was, you know, shamanism. I would call, and I don't get any other sense of like sort of. Uh, I mean, we all need all the help we can get, you know. And so I think that every good shaman knows that. And so, you know, if any oppressive force comes and takes hold after a while, you get to say, like, yeah, of course, like, I'm down with all these people. It's just not the end of the story, you know. <laughs> so yeah. there is definitely a saint invocational energy in, in anywhere in South America. And of course, uh, Guadalupe, the mother, is, is very popular down there, which I find is a great uh, tradition. So, you know, there's el elements of that, but it was nothing, no formal experience had anything to do with Christianity, except actually what I went through personally. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. From what I understand, you know, you <clears throat> well, I, I've heard differing things on it, but but you definitely take some of your cultural baggage or cultural knowledge into the experience with you, right? Well, um, yeah. This, I mean, this is set and setting, and and so it's funny, or like the placebo effect, and so this is the real weird thing about it is, and I, and I preface that. So will that ha will what happened with me happen to everyone? Not necessarily. It depends on what question you ask to the, to the, uh, uh, you know, the great, the great sky. So it really depends on what you're holding and what you're listening for and what you want answered. And, and this is, you know, set and setting and placebo. So we definitely bring our cultural biases, context, mental thinking, attachments, fears, insecurities, loves, associations, spiritual beliefs, religious beliefs, all that gets pulled out, you know, inside out in front of your third eye. Interesting. Was there any, I, I know oftentimes, depending on where you actually drink, um, or what country you're in, there's certain um, admixtures they put into the brew. Mm -hmm. Were you aware of him adding, like, for example, cacao or anything like that? Well, um, specifically, if we just deal with uh, what's happening actually in South America, because there's a lot happening in the States, and I feel like I've always been waiting for this kind of experience, and after it, I'm very glad that I did. And so uh, as, a, as you know, to add to that, basically there are a lot of admixture plants. I am not familiar that he used any. Um, I don't feel that he did, but cacao is generally not one of them unless you know some people doing that in the States or something. Generally, I don't know of too many people using cacao, but um, most common is use of detora, uh, toe, and they use just one or two flowers, and that's uh, for vision, but, you know, that plant on its own is uh, a dominatrix or something. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I've heard I've heard some scary things. Yeah. 
Yeah, I ate a bunch of those seeds one time, and and uh, that was interesting. So you know, but the thing about these phenomena is, if you're gonna do it, you gotta just die in the sense of whatever it is, you have to just say, okay, this is gonna be what it is, and I'm just gonna wait patiently, and I'll just stop being splattered eventually. And so that's very much how the ayahuasca was for me, because as it turns out, I was told that it turns out that this man makes the strongest brew in town and that it was apparently a double shot. So I was hoping that maybe he would sort of give me what he felt I was ready for. And maybe he did. So it was, quote unquote, too strong for my mind. But as soon as that thought comes up, you just have to say, well, I'll see you in a couple hours, friend, because you're not welcome here. Because that's the beginning of like an oh shit, and what are you going to do, you know? So the thing I, I, I always recommend and was always able to do was just remain with two points of awareness, which is one, I'm on a drug, right? And two, it'll wear off. Like it will have an end, you know? Mm-hmm. So that's that's – no matter what happens, if you can hold on to those two principles and just allow your body to not be alive and to really know that there's a difference between that kind of spiritual death and physically dying, right, then just wait it out, you know? It's kind of an element of letting go there. Surrender, total surrender. Yeah. I mean, total surrender to the fact that spirit is larger than body and this was my direct teaching and experience is like, you're outside. What do you want now? You know, dance around, fly around. What do you want to do? Mm. Well, you said you had previous experience with Salvia and DMT. How would I you? S- I said that off air, no? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, how would I? How would you compare, you know, in terms of the visions you received? So... Yeah, this is a really interesting thing where what I found is that I I didn't have a lot of visions with ayahuasca or yahe um, because I was having vision and there seemed to be a difference. And and I guess just like reflecting on my own personal communication, I have I'm a lifelong musician. I work with sound. And so perhaps I have developed a level of clair audience or something so for me i had gotten already visions i had already seen so much that i wasn't really asking to i i didn't need the verification of visual in order to have the communication if that makes sense like perhaps there's someone in there dangling whatever you can hold on to you know And so the vision and the visual aspect is important for some people sometimes to get certain aspects across. With that said, I was able to see the whole spirit world and many beings within that spirit world. Um, But I didn't need to look them in the face, so to speak, and say like, well, who are you? What are you about? What do you, you know, I mean, the world, it's, it's huge, you know. Would you would you say there is a difference in like the sentience with ayahuasca compared to something like salvia or, or just DMT? You know, I I feel like what we have is a phenomena of so many mixed facets together that it really takes exploring on so many levels. So, you know, it's all archetypal, it's all within and metaphoric, you know, and it's also outside and completely not you and and all of those factors have to be reconciled with together um so it almost we almost need a new term and i guess i'm holding on to like embodied metaphors or embodied archetypes or something like that so you know at one level there is one consciousness at another level there are many personalities that we're engaging with with these plants specifically Um, and they seem to have their different level of flow. So, um, as I said, DMT was not very close to ayahuasca for me, which was surprising, you know, and that's, of course, you know, if you're familiar, the Banisteriopsis is what they call Yahe or ayahuasca, not the Chacruna. 
so that kind of makes sense like what you feel is the vine you know and the other aspect is for vision um you know and so that's the uh, harmaline alkaloids and it's very interesting because no one really knows how those are on their own uh but you know obviously you know dennis mckenna has done some stuff with it and there terence talks terence mckenna talks about lots of the alkaloid uh, properties of that sure sure yeah 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 <clears throat> yeah dennis and terence you know, you know have done you know, fairly extensive work um although i i don't think i i honestly don't think we've come to I, it's, it's part of why I like listening to these stories because I don't think we've come to a full understanding of the entire experience. You know, maybe we can't. I mean, it mm. is one of those things that you have to vitally experience personally. I think. You know. Yeah, yeah. There is something really powerful. Like it's such a lost thing. Like your empirical experience matters. Like you know, mm -hmm. this is important. And so, I I was just blown away by the sense of like, oh, like here's god like and anybody would experience that and of course that's part delusional right because there's factors of set and setting but i truly know that if there was actually a mature conversation about it which said here's the set here's the setting here's the uh situation here's the fasting ritual like if we actually had a practice around it and if it wasn't so damn esoteric and and we were all so scared to publicly talk about it we would probably have a methodology for a, a somewhat repeatable experience which is that this is something divine that we've totally forgotten about mm -hmm. and like here's religion ha and you don't need it to be all kinds of fake pretend stuff and i think that is something where those who have the experience completely understand and those who haven't think they completely understand <laughs> exactly yeah exactly you know and it's 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 something that is kind of inherently subjective you know what i mean it's it's a vital personal experience and i mean that's what uh that's what that's what religion is supposed to be you know uh, without when you remove all the the gatekeepers and the dogma and the political nature of of religion you're left with you know vital personal spiritual experience yes and, and that's the good stuff you know i mean oh, that's yeah. the meat of it you know and you know like the aya ceremony is you know i mean that's something that's like that's still intact you know and it's something that can you know push you into that experience you can achieve these things through meditation etc you know but you know i'd love to, i'd love to play with that because that is something that i just don't think is a black and white sentence and it's something like i come from very much the yogic tradition i'm very invested in sanskrit and i'm very invested in learning what those people are talking about and the rituals that are done and all that and I'm so thankful that I actually had yogic uh, cosmology as a map to my experience because there are many states of being, you know, and the yogic philosophy has mapped that. But as far as saying you can do it without it has so many assumptive implications. And I want that to actually be a public conversation because if unless like the Dalai Lama drinks ayahuasca and says, okay, kids, I did it for you. It's nothing. I'm totally here. I can't see any value in this. And like 20 other spiritual leaders, I think we won't really understand the value of these things within the spiritual practice context. As I was able to observe, there is experience and then there is integration. And that was an experience, and now it's my process of integrating what I was shown. Because if I just rack up experiences, that will cause no transformation within my being. That will cause nothing but just having seen some crazy shit, which is not going to transform me. The spiritual practices, right, yoga, meditation, all these things help to just continue that realization to transform. 
Um, so like it, it's almost as if instead of building faith, you could have experience and then your experience can can stimulate and motivate you to want to practice your yoga, meditation, chanting, whatever it is that you consider as a daily practice. Obviously, drinking ayahuasca should not necessarily be a daily practice unless you're going to be an ayahuasca or shaman in the middle of the Amazon jungle. Otherwise, we have to learn how to be kind of naked. Well, what, a, mm-hmm. what about mm-hmm. in terms of, uh, you know, Saint Odemi, for example, uh, I mean, they have, I think, kids as young as like five years old doing ayahuasca weekly. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that community, which is fairly large, I mean, at least in Brazil, um, they all seem pretty well adjusted. Yeah, I mean, that depends on really what you call adjusted. And so um, I don't want to be in, in a religion <laughs> so uh-huh. you know uh-huh. where is the context of pure naked spirituality um and and how do we get the sort of rights to practice uh shamanism uh in this culture because that's what we really need and and it's really a naked path right now and we have to take very baby steps but we can't just say like oh yeah well we're not lakotas or we're not Colombians or what because then we just steal everybody's traditions and sort of uh parrot them but what we really need to find is something that's so incredibly powerful that is so digestible that everybody can kind of come along you know yeah yeah I I honestly think the last couple points you made um are are extremely important um uh, first of all, you know, you, you hit on the word integration. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, how, and exactly how do we how do we integrate these things into our own practice? Well, I mean, that's what we should try to do, right? I mean, we try to integrate all of our experience into the whole. You know, um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think I think what you're saying is is really vitally important the whole subjective personal nature you know your how you personally identify with your culture and what you want to do mm-hmm. um and how you how you edit your experiences into that larger framework mm-hmm. you know yeah i mean it's not about experiences this is the weird thing it's like the first level of spiritual realization is experience but the second level is integration and transformation Uh otherwise we can just rack up experiences our whole life but really who cares like because ayahuasca for example is so large you could travel dimensions infinitely but what is it going to do Reminds me of a uh, Terence McKenna quote. It's uh, the question's no longer how do we find the alchemical stone. It's uh, what do we do with it? Yeah. And so what I'm trying to do is see the basis of all shamanic cultures. And there is a thread. And thankfully, Terence has helped to preserve this thread. Uh, you know, the ethnobotanists of the 70s, Richard Evan Schultes, what Leary and Richard Alpert did. Like, there is a grabbing on to this indigenous shamanic spirituality. Uh, if you haven't read Merce Eliad's book, uh, Ar- Archaic States of Ecstasy, you know, these are profound insights. Uh, all the YouTube videos of shamans. I was watching a Tamang shaman uh, in a whole ceremony on YouTube, he took me there. I was like, this is too much, you know? And, and so we really have access to these traditions. The thing is really, can we do enough work on ourselves to have enough respect and enough careful attitude and enough humbleness to really see what this is about sort of this dimension of reality between inside and outside that is malleable. You know, there is a part of the wall that's evolvable. And so as I try to point to that, I consider it sort of like our culture. And there's this like lingual, uh, malleable substance of really like, you know, so is it Thor or is it a lightning bolt or is it, you know, static electricity? Like these things are really relative and they help to really guide the direction of the culture we're living in mythology uh, and that's really what it seems and then when you take healing like practicing the art of healing 
and transformation of the individual as sort of like they're practicing a mythology and the herbalist or the healer is really helping to carve a new mythology. You know, the mythology is I'm not good. I'm not good. I'm not well. I'm not well, which is really something more like, you know, I'm not worthy of healing. I'm not worthy of healing. I deserve pain and suffering. And like that's a mythology and it's a totally relative mythology and it can be transformed uh, through story. Yeah, yeah, kind of, you know, the the living mythology, you know, I, I, I like that, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, because we think of mythology, we think of, uh, <laughs> you know, ancient, so, so some kind of ancient, you know, uh, uh, stories, <laughs> you know, that we read about in school or something, you know. But it's very real and very vital, you know. I mean, the, the only constant in the universe is change, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> And and those those myths are are still evolving and incorporating themselves into each other. You know, and as as we communicate, as the world kind of gets smaller in that sense, it's also getting larger because we have all these new mythologies, all these this new synthesis. You know. Um, yeah, and we need to and we need to figure out what to do with this. And I think actually that's really what it seems like Terence McKenna was trying to do with 2012 is to hit some sort of placebo point. You know, and to get back on the ball as far as some sort of co-creative experience, you know, because this is what we're, this is the part of mythology, like this is the part of science where we're doomed if we think that everything is happening to us, you know, it's literally the creator is creating a role of a victim. And then fulfilling the role of the victim. So sickness happens to us. Ecological devastation happens to us. Like all these paradigms are mythologies. They're just mythical. We have no more idea. You know, we really don't. Scientifically, we have no more idea what happens after you die than hunter-gatherer people did in, you know, Neanderthals living in caves in Europe. You know, 80,000 80, years ago, they we still – they probably actually knew a lot more because they had shamanic traditions. And all of those weirdos are saying like, hey, you guys, there's this world beyond this one and there's beings I communicate with. And, you know, there's a place for those. It's called the mental institution these days. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, uh, you know that's – another thing about older cultures, you know um, – if, if, if you were a person who had insomnia, for example, well, you fulfilled your role in society by being the person who watched the fires while everyone else slept. You, you yeah. were a valuable person, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, many people who had what we would call mental illness today, schizophrenia, etc., would train as shamans, you know. Um, and that would, first of all, help their own consciousness because, you know, they're fulfilling a vital role and they were being told constantly that they were sick, you know. Yeah. Um, and they would help other people because they would have a certain skill set and certain knowledge, you know, um, you know, so, yeah, mental illness, that's something that, you know, it, it bothers me the way mental illness is treated. So I, I would dare to say that my ayahuasca journey was a journey into going into a state that several basically two friends that I've met recently, um, one of them, their mom called like the mental hospital on them and the other one is taking you know pills for her stability because she basically had a breakdown where she thought you know she told her parents Lakota indig uh sorry the Lenape I'm here in New Jersey so the Lenape people were talking to her and telling her to do this ritual and then all this stuff started happening and this girl just is totally blown open her energetic field just is super open and she does not have anyone to turn to except for a bunch of panicking mental heads you know they where they just get into their mind and so at one point she explained to me that she was laying down and she knew she was dying and she just said i just need you all to get around me and i just need to die like it's it's over and like anybody who had any sense to themselves would just say yes you're dying here comes the death and rebirth like it's over yes complete the energy and then she would eventually get to the place where she would have been like okay it's over i died here i am and we would have said welcome welcome you know share what you've shared and it wouldn't be a situation where 
or she could be in, a, in on pharmaceuticals. But now, of course, her parents are saying, you know, oh, she's sick and we don't know what to do, but she's just going to take these pills for the rest of her life. So, you know, what I saw with ayahuasca, I really got into the state, that similar state, and I held on to my sanity. But for about four hours, there was nothing to hold on to, you know, in the morning, there was just nothing to hold on to. I was in a babbling psychotic state where everything that was coming out was I was seeing everybody, you know, anybody who talked to me, I saw their whole life, you know, it was over, it was completely overwhelming. And yet, I was able to hold on to the fact that like, okay, there's still this witness, you know, and this will end, right? I'm on a drug, right? Okay, here's a drug. And so the thing is integration, again, how much percentage of people who are seen as schizophrenic or whatever are having some sort of shamanic experience that would have been integrated in a way different way than, oh my God, you need to be isolated. What's wrong with you? Oh. And everybody yeah. brings fear around the person's transformation. Now, that's not to say that some people do have mental illness or whatever. Like we need to understand that. But even if 10% of people are having this shamanic awakening and have no culture to turn to, no one to turn to. This is the gap I want to fill with the Seeking the Medicine series of being able to say, well, you know, we've got someone down the street who knows about these things. And sorry that your previous culture wasn't able to give you that, but this guy is or this woman is. Just acknowledging the, 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 the idea of initiation being initiated mm -hmm. into something you know what mm -hmm. what lesson does a sickness have for you and it's, yeah. it's different for everybody right yeah. i mean even something like cancer i know a lot of people that have had terminal cancer and were grumpy mean and then they get diagnosed and a couple months later it's like well they they've they're totally new they're totally transformed yeah you know they've totally come to a new understanding in life because of that illness Right. Yes. And the doctor can't tell them that the doctor can't tell them, oh, you're going to learn this from your illness or the, your disease. It had to be a personal, direct experience because of the sickness. Well, you know, because of the ignorance, I would say even the sickness, what I learned, what I was taught, what I was trained in this night was that sickness and this is what people report very, very, very clearly, is that sickness actually starts the moment you have the disharmonious experience and you don't resolve it. That's when the sickness starts. And that that's the cause of sickness. Cancer is 25, 30 year later manifestation because we did not deal with that disharmonious engagement. And this is something that ayahuasca and these plant teachers are repeatedly telling us. And so that three-year-old that got hit in the face by the dad or whatever it is needs something. And there's nowhere to turn for that kind of work in this culture or, or here we go in the sense of we're starting to now recognize that and we're starting to rebirth that to have room in our culture because it turns out that that's the most significant thing that's needed is people need to be able to cry together, hug together, hang out together and actually express themselves. That's not too much to ask, but it's scary. You know, it's, it's definitely at first it's scary and liberating, you know, just like taking mushrooms or, or ayahuasca, you know, but it's, it's really ch time for us as a culture to get towards the disharmonious, uh, ripples that we start to throw out on other people and start to really carve our ability to not throw darts all over the place sure sure it's it's terrifying to an entire culture built on materialism yeah mm -hmm. yeah but you know they'll either uh get, you know go willingly or have their hair pulled sure. and, and they might have to drag most of us down with them and we're in a really kind of emotional, exciting point of our history where we're really trying to say like, hey, you, hey, everybody, like, we need to talk here. Like, do you want to sink or swim? Like, everybody, like, can we just get into a situation of actually uh, discussing what's at hand here, you know? And obviously, politicians are not going to save us, like, 
environmental you know marketing is not going to save us buying more goji berries from china is not going to save us we need a tremendous yep. level of of psychic inner transformation yeah i i, I completely agree with that yeah um <clears throat> it's going to take fundamental just fundamental change on the personal level and on the cultural level um r really is what i think you, you know you, i mean you could put uh you, you could put as many patches on the system as you want, you know, you yeah. could buy as, as many, you know, green friendly bottles of soap stuck in a plastic bottle yeah. <laughs> that it's, you want. It's, that's again, that's a side effect, you know, that's right. all exactly. side effects. The, and, and so this is actually the hopeful side of that. Like really only a few people need to just be nice. And like, literally that's the revelation because if you were truly just nice there's no ability to kind of cajole that. And if you were just able to hold on to that just good heartedness, eventually all of those waves would start settling because it'd just be like, well, shit, that's what I want. Why am I fighting? Why am I resistant? And so what I really suggest is we need to, you know, find the others, <laughs> right? Get into a situation where our paradigm is beginning to blossom in a way that shows not a bunch of preachy people who are afraid of dying, but an example to follow, you know? Like, hey, isn't this nice? We're being nice, we're hugging, we're eating organic food, whatever it is. Like, yeah, our friend grew this, here, here's peppermint tea. And again, make that a majority situation to invite those who are first interested in doing that and then sort of branching out to there. So I kind of call that like the cottage rebuild and so there's many levels of sort of cottage rebuilding. And that's really, I want to make it undeniable. And I think it can be because being nice just transforms anybody eventually. Sure, sure. You know, it, it's, um, I've, I've kind of come to the, the thinking, <clears throat> like the, the revolutionary ideas of the last century belong in the last century, right? We need new, <laughs> we need, we need new models. Definitely. And, and I think there, I think there should be some joy in it. You yeah. know, I mean, there, there should be some joy in it. And, and, and um, there, you're right. is like building those networks, building those communities and, and showing people that this can be joyous, celebratory, you know, that this is, this is just a really just a better way to live. Right. Or, or um, just go out, you know, if this boat is sinking, we should either dance down to the water or, you know, have have a transformation. Like yeah. it's it's but either way, you would enjoy the time dancing much better than you would enjoy the time being disconnected and angry. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm really looking forward to um, I'm really looking forward to to. You know, seeing more, hearing more about the, you know, you're you're seeking the medicine project. I, I think it's a I think it's a positive thing. I, I'm really interested in it. Cool. Well, I'll just take a moment to put the call out there. I'm definitely looking for people who can help with the project. Um, you know, my website has all the information on it. It's in the about section on return to nature us, and everything the best I can do is broken down there. Um, and it shows the projects I'm working on and post-production editing is just completely so much. So if anybody's interested in being part of it, uh, please email me at dan at return to nature us and we can definitely talk about it. Cool. Cool. Yeah. I, I know we're like, I, I think we're probably past time. Um, cool. It's been such a good conversation, though. Uh, first yeah. of all, just give everybody your um, just give everybody your contact information so people can get a hold of you, <laughs> like uh, the other content, you know, the whole spiel. You know what I mean? The entire. Yeah, yeah. I guess I guess that's really it. It's funny we were kind of uh, uh, intuiting. So you know, return to nature us is my website, and then of course I have a Facebook page, which is also return to nature skills, and also I have a YouTube channel, which is called return to nature skills, and basically I'm just trying my hardest to put this in a way that gets the the points out there. So it's definitely a, a difficult task to articulate these things. Is the fun game, you know? Yeah, sure, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, well, Dan, 
it's been it's been fantastic to talk to you again. It, it really has been. The last conversation was great. This conversation was fantastic. Yeah, that was oh, great. Yeah. Yeah, thank you guys. There's so much to say. And, you know, it's really funny just how every time somebody asks me about my personal ayahuasca experience, the, my intuition just goes towards like what's really important is what I learned from it and how I was transformed and the messages that I received to share. And like that's always so much more important than like what happened with my individual ego. My individual ego got demolished, splattered across the cosmos and did not exist for 14 hours. Yet the lessons that I received are really the very important aspect of what we can do to come together and sort of create some change because – that's what I asked, and I highly pray and recommend for you, if you're going to engage these plant teachers, psilocybin, salvia, you know, ayahuasca, whatever it is, try, try, try your hardest to ask them how you can help, how you can help all of us, because they are very deep teachers, and they're very wise, and it's also their earth. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Wise words and good, solid advice. Thank you, friends. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for joining us again. Um, Yeah, everyone, uh, contact information, as always, will be in the description to this video or however, whatever medium in the future you are listening uh, to this podcast. Free Radical Media Podcast. Eric Scott Picard, Patrick Ryan, Dan DeLion. (laughs) Have a good evening. Bless you.